So, hello and welcome to the spring series of the UEA Postgraduate History Research Seminar and the first seminar of the semester. We are a hybrid seminar series, so we'd like to welcome both our online audience and Emma uh, and our audience in the room. It's really lovely to see all you guys tonight. Uh, and also our speaker, Louise Kennedy as well, who's joining us in the room. Uh, and as I say, Eo, Emma Eo, who's joining us via Teams from the University of Durham. So we're going to start first away, first of all, with Louise's paper. Uh, Louise uh, has a degree in history and gained her MLit in archives and record management at Dundee. Uh, as a qualified archivist, she's currently taking a career break to concentrate on her PhD studies and is in her second year of research. Throughout her career, Louise has tried to be an advocate for access to archival material for everyone. And as a committee member of the Suffolk Local History Council, she is also promoting their aims of education uh, through the study of local history. Louise's main supervisor is Professor Mark Bailey, who we're delighted can join us this evening, uh, and who's interested in medieval social and economic history and his research into manorial Suffolk and his recent publication on the transformation of the Suffolk coast, sort of 1200 to 1600, mirror the subject matter of Louise's thesis. Uh, John Gregory is also providing supervision on the geographic information uh, systems element of the thesis, looking at maps and coastal charts. I think Louise is going to tell us a bit more about it all. So I will share your PowerPoint. Well, thanks Louise for that introduction um, and also for all your organisation and um, getting the IT to work this evening, um, just in case I forget at the end to thank you. So hi and welcome to everyone here this evening in person. Um, I don't think we've got anybody out there virtually, but hi if somebody does join later on. As you can see from the slide, the proposed title for my thesis is Eastern Babins, circa 1500 to 1750, a study of community, kinship and coastal erosion. Preparing for this paper has been very useful as I've had to reflect on where I currently am with my research. But I've also realised that 20 minutes is not a long time to get across background details, complex theories and to discuss research findings. So my paper tonight will be setting out the context of the where, why and how of the study and then examining some testamentary evidence left by a handful of Eastern Babance inhabitants from the first part of the 1500s and analysing what it can tell us about the community and kinship at that date. Finally, a comparison of two maps which will illustrate the extent of the erosion over a 200 year period and will highlight the dramatic rate of such a change. All that remains today of Eastern Balance is just a thin strip of arable land and a handful of 20th century houses. It's just to the north of Southwold. You can see I've marked it on the map here. It's on the Suffolk coast and is part of an area known as the Sandlings. This stretch of coastline is made up of remote villages which are accessible by one roadway in and out just off the A12. There's no coast road, again, as you can see from the map, with rivers silted up estuaries, salt marshes, sandy cliffs, dramatic scenery and big Suffolk skies, it's obvious why this area is designated as an area of outstanding natural beauty. You can see the beauty of the area from the images on the screen, which were taken from a walk I had along the beach last month. But these images also illustrate the effects of the ever-present erosion on the sandy cliffs, with fallen trees and power cables and water pipes dangling over the cliff edge. The sea has been the most important natural influence for the area, moulding the coastline and altering the history of the Sandlings. The main ambition of my thesis is to undertake a micro study of a community, examining a specific part of this dynamic fractured coastline over a set time period with relation to the families displaced by the erosion. This should allow an analysis of the socio-economic impact of dramatic environmental change and provide an understanding of the community and kinship ties ultimately illustrating how erosion changed its lives. The early modern community at Eastern was chosen due to the fact that it has suffered a total loss of all its land and physical structures, with the population moving out. In around 1500, antiquarians have written that the community was at or just past its zenith and heading into decline. Micro studies often help us to answer big questions through the study of small places. Professor Andy Wood, who favours a micro-study over big history, tells us that studying the local is not just about a methodological focus, it's also fluid, shifting, historical entity in its own right, and as such is as worthy of study as a royal courts or grand diplomacy. 
I'm hoping my focused approach will lead to a greater understanding of the diversity of the community, its social structures and its ways of working and thinking. Probate material from over 120 wills already transcribed as providing evidence of kinship strategies and inheritance patterns. I find that research studies into early modern post-mortem inheritance patterns in rural areas using wills mainly concentrates on looking at agricultural communities and evidence of comparative coastal maritime communities is scarce. But tangible evidence of an economy which includes fishing and coastal trading is emerging and long lost topographical features are being named and described. So let's look at Eastern in the early 1500s. The image shown here on the left is a smaller section of the one that was on my first slide. It's taken from a coastal chart of Suffolk drawn up in 1539 for the fortification of large sections of the coast as Henry VIII feared an invasion from the combined forces of France and Spain. This section shows a view of the communities as being visible from the sea. And going from left to right, we have Southwold first, then an image of a gun battery with a beacon structure behind it, and then we have the village of Easton. It's standing on a brown sandy cliff with the nest protruding out to sea. Cove Hive and Kessingland villages are then shown further along the coast. Whilst these are stylized depictions of the communities and cannot be taken as realistic views of what they actually look like, the illustrations of the church towers are of importance as they would have been navigational markers for those out at sea. And the chart is correct in showing those churches with known spires at this date. Cove Hive next to Easton, and in the insert image, Lower Stock, which is further up the coast. Thomas Gardner, an antiquarian, provides the earliest descriptions of the lost community, and he writes in 1754 that it had a church dedicated to St Nicholas, the fisherman's patron, and in earlier times it was well populated, it was a well populated place, and that fishing was an occupation which was practiced there. Camden, writing around 1610, tells us that Eastern Ness shooteth out to sea and is the most easterly place in all Britain. He also tells us that upon the point of this promontory standeth Easton, a village of fishermen, well near eaten up by the sea. Topographically, from a 1531 manorial survey, which I've recently transcribed and translated, we now know that as well as the church, sandy cliffs and the Ness, there were at least 500 acres of land in the Eastern Balance Manor. In the north, it had a haven situated between it and neighbouring Cove Hive, it had a mere, a mill mound, it had acres of common marshes called Boulder's Mere. 222 of the acres were called North Heth, which in earlier days had sustained a rabbit warren, as well as a separate chapel dedicated to St Margaret. It had areas described as Scotland Row and Bloaters Hill, and its population lived mainly abutting onto King's Way. But what was the size of this population? Well, the low tax subsidy of 1524-25 is recognised as the most comprehensive list amongst the 16th century tax listings. It's been cited by many historians undertaking similar demographic studies as an invaluable source for the, of the population figures. The assessment was structured in a way to ensure that most men contributed regardless of how they earned their money. Subsidy was paid on either land holdings, goods or wages, whichever brought in the most income. Immigrants, those not, those not born in England and described as alliance in the subsidy were listed and taxed at double the rates. There are differing opinions within academic research as, the, as the validity of multipliers which need to be used to reconstruct the population figure from the numbers listed. I've used multipliers given by Goose and Hind in their work on estimating local population sizes and arrived at a crude population of Eastern Balance in 1524 of around 324 people. But how does this compare with earlier figures? As I said before, the assumption from earlier writings is that the population reached its zenith in the latter 1400s and was then heading into decline. By 1524, it is probable that the population of England as a whole had not yet recovered to the level of it was in 1327, prior to the Black Death decimating 50% of the population. It is therefore noticeable that the parish of East and Bavance had witnessed a 187% increase in its population over that period, as in 1327 it had around 113 inhabitants. An even higher increase could be seen at Southwold at 370%. Southwold had become a borough in 1490 and by 1524 was benefiting from changes in the pattern of trade and industry, 
which favoured the economies of Suffolk's towns over its rural hinterlands. The Cove Heights, eastern neighbour to the north, had not recovered to its 1327 population figure. So the population rate of some of the communities of the small corner of Suffolk appears to be thriving. Further research though is required to understand what factors are driving this. Let's now look at some extracts and testamentary evidence from the wills of a handful of Eastern Balance inhabitants who died between 1528 and 1544 and see the occupational trends which are evident. In examining these wills, it must be noted that some property and goods would almost certainly have been transferred by these testators prior to the writing of the wills of which we can have no knowledge. Robert Lee was a testator who acknowledged in his will written and proven in 1533 at the Suffolk Archdeacon Court, that he was whole of mind and in good memory, but sick in body. Others said in their preambles, they were of good or whole body and mind and of perfect remembrances. These phrases were used to describe a person's physical condition and mental state, acknowledging that while death may be soon, they were capable of writing down their wishes. Many of the men had connections with the fishing trade as nets and ropes figure highly as movable bequests to family and others, as does the practice of writing, sorry, as does the practice of writing wills prior to voyages, which could take them away from their families and community for months at a time and with no certainty that they would return. Thomas Bloomville writes, I will that Catherine, my wife, shall have all her 20 nets of 12 score, which she brought unto me as her proper goods. The nets, being a valuable resource, had been brought to the marriage, possibly being bequeathed by her father. Jane Whittle, in her study of female inheritance patterns in Norfolk, concludes that although sons were usually bequeathed land and property, daughters were more likely to inherit cash or goods. Whilst land and property, gen property generally increased in value for the men, for the women, the value of the goods would largely depreciate. For the wives and daughters of fishermen, the inheritance of fishing nets, deemed goods, provided them not only with the ability to keep valuable equipment within the family, but also the option of obtaining income by putting them out for use by others who may have been unable to buy their own, in return for the payment of money or perhaps for quantities of fish. Thomas Bloomville also writes, I bequeath to Joan, my daughter, two manfare of nets of 12 score of the best. A manfare is generally recognised as a term for a pair of nets, and the 12 score refers to the size of the mesh. There are differing types of nets bequeathed in the wills, illustrating the varied types of fishing which was being carried on from Easton. Spurling nets for catching sprats, fluids which were drift nets for catching herring, and great nets used for catching cod. At the time of the writing of these wills, some of these nets and ropes were in use on voyages, as mention is made of bequeathing the nets when the fishing is done. Henry Lawson's bequest is unusual, made to come into effect if he departs going or coming on this voyage, referring to the fact that he is someone who wrote his will prior to a voyage. He left to the townspeople of Eastern Balance all the carvel, board and plank and timber that I have bought. The gift comes with a stipulation that the people of the town must build the double carvel within a year and call her the Harry. Written in 1542 and proven two years later in 1544, it's unclear at this stage of research if Henry survived the voyage to build the carvel vessel himself. Carvels were of 50 to 90 tonnes and a double one would have had two masts. Such vessels are recorded as being used as protection for other smaller fishing vessel, uh, fishing boats journeying north for the cod season, which continued past the Faroes to Iceland. The Duke of Norfolk is recorded as charging various owners for protection with his carvel and the list of those being protected includes three named vessels from Eastern Baden. Through nominal linkage, it is feasible that Henry had connections to Cornelius Lawson, an immigrant listed on the Eastern Lay Tax Subsidy Return of 1524. Of the 60 men originally listed on the return, eight are stated to be immigrants, which relates to a high 13.3% of the population. Many immigrants were listed in other Suffolk coastal parishes in 1524, and further research is required to understand the extent of the, the effect they had on the economy of the areas they were in. Downey Beck was one such immigrant who asked in his will of 1528 that 22 pounds shall be paid to the Church of Easton to the making of a cross of silver and gilt, 
This is a large sum of money when four to five years earlier, in 1524, he was only taxed on two pounds worth of goods. The will was a place where those nearing or fearing death could ensure that outstanding debts, loans and promises were fulfilled. Robert Lee, the testator who was sick in body at the time of the writing of his will, had an outstanding debt to John Jetter of Lowestoft. He made provision for the repayment of the monetary debt of 10 shillings, but he also owed Jetter a barrel of pitch for the waterproofing of barrels or boats. Jetter family were known merchants involved in the Icelandic fishing trade, as we'll see a bit later. The will of John Burrell provides no occupational clues, but it can be nominally linked to an Edward Burrell. Edward was a mariner of Eastern Bavance, and he was charged with illegally bringing a child of 16 out of the Orkney Islands in 1535. This is recorded in the work by John Webb on Henry Tooley, a merchant from Ipswich who also traded with Iceland in the 1530s. It's assumed by Webb that this child was brought to Suffolk to be an apprentice or a crew member for Edward. The will of John Burrell does provide further kinship links through his choice of witnesses. We can see listed a William Spooner, parson, a brother of our final testator, James Spooner, merchant. James's will, proven at the Property Court of Canterbury, is the longest of those studied so far, covering three pages of tightly packed text, and is far ranging in the contents of its bequests. Specific evidence of his line of commerce as a merchant is lacking, as no details are provided of goods or equipment. However, his wealth is evident in over 90 pounds of monetary bequests to family, friends and the poor. In the 1524 lay tax subsidy, wealthier taxpayers were asked for payments or anticipations in advance of the rest of the population. And James Spooner is listed as such and being assessed at £100. In his will, he provided funds to repair and upgrade local churches, including St Nicholas. He also left funds for the glazing of new windows of the church and bequeathed £20 to the making and amending of the highways from Girlings Gate to Benneker and to the south end of Potter's Bridge, and also to the making of the new pier at the Haven. These last two mentioned bequests potentially provide clues that he was involved in bringing goods in and out of the haven and wished to upgrade the pier or the quay and the roadways for the movement of his goods onwards. His son Richard was asked to oversee these bequests, but further bequests to him are dependent on him remaining living in his father's property at Eastern Babbins. The 1531 manorial survey I mentioned earlier also provides more evidence of James as well and his standing in the social hierarchy of Easton. He is listed first on the survey as one of those signing to witness the survey details are correct. The Domesne holdings are then given and Spooner is noted as the manorial farmer and tenant of the hall close. In essence here, he is leasing the manor. His merchant status can be confirmed, but from other sources. I found him listed on a certificate of ships returned out of Iceland in the state papers of 1533. This records the Iceland fishing fleet as it anchored at Dunwich Haven on its return from its annual voyage. This certificate has previously been cited as confirmation that Dunwich sent 22 vessels to Iceland at this date, but closer inspection of the actual returns, as opposed to the state paper index, shows that although the vessels are lying in Dunwich Haven, 11 are listed coming from other Suffolk and Norfolk ports and creeks, including three from Southwold and one each from Cove Hive and Eastern. The Eastern vessel called the Trinity is owned by James Spooner, and he's listed as the merchant on the certificate as well. A Richard Spooner, possibly his son Richard or a brother, is listed as the master of one of the Southwold vessels. And Diane Beck, mentioned earlier, has links with a Richard Spooner as well, as he bequests his half share in a boat, co-owned with Richard, to be sold. We also find John Jetter of Lowestoft on this certificate, who was owed a barrel of pitch by Robert Lee. He is given as owner and merchant for three vessels, all lying off Lowestoft and all part of the Iceland fleet. As well as fishing, men from Easton were involved with coastal trading. Vessels from Easton, Bavins can be found in the index Newcastle, Newcastle Chamberlain accounts of 1508 to 1511, transporting coal down the East Coast. Eight different vessels are named within a four year period. Frustrating, the owners' names are not given in the index, although one vessel is called the Trinity. So let's conclude this discussion of some elements of my research so far with a very brief overview of the erosion and deposition on this stretch of the coastline. The earliest county map of Suffolk was surveyed by Christopher Saxton and published in 1574 
you could see um, a section showing Easton on the left hand of the slide. Between the marked red and purple arrow, you can see Easton Ness. This nest stretching out to sea in 1574 has completely been eroded 200 years later if you compare the area with Hodkinson's map of 1783 on the right hand side. Caution does have to be exercised as to the accuracy of the mapping by Saxton, and this is an area of my research which requires further analysis. But Easton Ness, as Camden described in 1610 as shooting out to sea, is shown as a similar shape and size on other examples of pre-Saxton maps of the whole country and on 16th century maritime portland charts. The 1531 survey confirms the existence of a haven situated lying between Cove Hive and Easton. This haven silted up between 1531 and 1574 when Saxton shows a stretch of water cut off from its exit into the sea. You can see the funny little tadpole shape marked with the red arrow. Over time, this trapped area of water or mere receded and separated into what is now known as Cove Hive and Eastern Broads, brackish areas of water which today are regularly breached by the North Sea. You can see the two arrows on the Hodkinson's map. The 1531 survey also describes land holdings in Eastern Bavins, which are described as abutting the sea to the east, but then a marginal note tells us that they are devastateur come there or devastated by the sea. And on that note, I will sum up by saying that during the early 1500s, the testamentary evidence shows a high percentage of Eastern Bavance inhabitants were engaged with fishing and coastal trading. Property was in the main being passed down to close family and valuable movable goods such as fishing nets were bequeathed to kinsmen or women to ensure they were kept within the community. A tangible sense of the community and its strong kinship links can be detected. Harold Fox, in his study on the evolution of early fishing communities on the South Devon coast, concludes that such communities displayed solidarity amongst themselves. But Easton was also a community looking out to the wider world across the North Sea with its fishing and trading voyages. It was home to immigrants from Scotland, Iceland, Spain and the Flemish countries. But it was also a community dealing with dramatic environmental change. Within the next hundred years, it would rapidly alter with further large tracts of land eroding and the population moving on elsewhere, severing family and kinship ties, leaving Gardner to describe it finally in 1754 as a diminished parish of only two dwellings and about 10 souls. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louise. I, it's fantastic how your research from like really legal documents just sort of builds such a picture of like the sort of the social value of things like a net, which you, you wouldn't get from you know just reading that. It's fantastic. So thank you ever so much. Right, I'm going to stop uh, sharing this slide. Hopefully, if I can get out of this, stop sharing. And I'm going to pass this over to Emma, who's hopefully going to be able to share her PowerPoint for us as well. So Emma Yeo is a second year history PhD student at Durham University, and her research focuses on community experiences of mortality crises in the long 17th century, uh, from 1580 to 1720. Uh, and she is combining analysis of parish register data from across northeast England with qualitative sources such as court records. She's also interested in crisis studies more generally and has been involved in an ongoing autoethnography project looking at PGR experiences during the pandemic, which is huge and relevant to all of us. <laughs> um, Emma, I will get rid of me and we'll pass over to you. Thank you. Oh, brilliant. Thanks, Louise. Hi, everyone. My name is Emma and I'm a second year PhD student at Durham. Today I'm going to be talking to you about late 16th century demographic crises in the northeast of England from plague to famines. Now unfortunately my map, unlike Louise's, doesn't have a sea monster, but hopefully it's pretty nonetheless. Now the area I'm going to be speaking about today is the historic planet of Durham, so it's the area stretching from the border with North Yorkshire in the south, Cumberland in the west, the sea on the east coast and then Northumberland to the north. And the map on the background of the slide is a 17th century map by the cartographer John Speed. And the region we're thinking about, Northeast England, can also be seen on the more boring modern map on the left of the screen too. So before I get started thinking about crisis, I want to briefly mention some of the key factors of Northeast England in this time period. Northern parishes were typically very large and many contained widely dispersed settlements. To take an example, St Oswald's on the outskirts of the city of Durham contained both a suburb of the city and numerous small villages and townships miles distant from the city proper. 
This means that many parishes have areas of differing social and economic characteristics within them. And there are also differing uh, economic circumstances in the region itself too. There are boom areas such as the coal mining settlement of Wickham or the mercantile city of Newcastle. And then we have rural areas which are themselves suffering from population decline in this period. The main source I've been using in my studies of early modern crises so far is parish registers. These are demographic records of all of the baptisms, marriages and burials occurring in a parish. And thanks to the diligence of both later Tudor monarchs and parish clerks across the realm, these survived in varying levels of completeness from the mid 1530s onwards. For Northeast England, the majority of the surviving 16th century parish registers are from County Durham, and there are much lower levels of surviving for survival from Northumberland. One of the key benefits of using parish registers is that it allows for high level demographic analyses of key events on a parish by parish basis, bringing together a regional picture of crisis experiences. In addition, you can use lived experiences of life events to um, see them from a different perspective using the same data. And in this presentation, I'll be looking at historical demogra demography in its most basic sense. When I talk about a mortality crisis here, I'm in this instance referring to burials reaching two times their average figure. And there are other aspects to crisis, such as their effects on baptisms and marriages, but for brevity, I'll focus on deaths alone here. For the remainder of our time together, I'd like to focus on two crises, the dearth of 1587 and the combined dearth of plague of, and plague of 1597, and show what analysing these documents can tell you about communal experiences of crisis in the region. And our first crisis is brought to life most vividly by this quote, which is inserted into the parish register of St Oswald's on the outskirt of Durham City by the parish clerk. And it's a visceral indication of the pain and suffering caused by food shortages in this period. It says, this year, 1587, the price of corn was as followeth, and the greatest part of last year before going, so that many poor people were supposed to die for lack of bread, notwithstanding great store in the hands of the hard-hearted crawls, yet still raise the price until harvest. One of the key debates surrounding famines is the extent to which they are a man-made disaster or one created by environmental factors. The work of Amartya Sen is instrumental on this question. Then considered key instances of modern famines and argue that famine is caused not by a decline in available food, but by a fall in what he described as food entitlement. And this can be seen in action in this quote. The parish clerk appears to be suggesting that it isn't necessarily that food was completely unavailable, to the level that would produce the devastation experienced in 1587, but that it was being stockpiled by greedy farmers, and the results of this can be seen in practice. The South Bailey of Durham was an area which would be, a century later at the time of the half tax, populated by doctors and lawyers, and it survived the famine relatively untouched. By contrast, in St Oswald's Parish, which is on the Great North Road and was heavily exposed to migrants travelling for relief alongside poor rural householders, there was a desperate situation in which pe poor people were dying in the open. When thinking about famine in 1587, a key aspect to bear in mind is that the marginal were the most vulnerable. That's not only those who wandered as vagrants, but I would also argue those with less strong links to the community, even if they have been settled there for a longer period. And if we want to think on a parish level, then the situation is most clearly problematic in Bolden, where burials reached twice the norm in 1586 and things escalate much more clearly in 1587 when burials reach crisis levels in parishes across the region. And I used regression analyses to try and find common denominators between the parishes most badly affected, but proxy data using um, methods of analysis using information from later decades or earlier decades made this a little bit tricky, but factors such as population size and wealth were only able to explain around 30% of the variance between parish by parish experiences. So the actual mechanics of what is causing the differential mortality between parishes is something I want to explore in more detail, but for now it remains an interesting fact that some parishes escape almost unscathed while others are completely devastated. Burials in Horton Lascaun are 2.6 times the average, while Red Marshall escaped with burials only a third above normal, and the intricate interconnections between cause and effect in uncovering the story of famine means that telling a regional narrative can become extremely difficult, so my next slide is going to talk about one specific parish case study of 1587. So Witten Gilbert is a parish located in the northwest of Durham City with an estimated population in 1563 of approximately 163 inhabitants. 
and the small population of the parish was a contributing factor to the small number of burials in the years up to 1587. And it is notable that the increase in burials was only around 43% above the norm in 1587. However, despite the small population of the parish, there is still a sign of the crisis that occurred. The first burial recorded for 1587 is the death of a perignus, a stranger named William at a place called Fulthor. And the clustering of burials for 1587 in the early winter is suggestive of the importance of starvation after the harvest to mortality within the parish. Even in places that experience a relatively small increase in burials, there is still some devastation that had taken place. And then my second um, case study which I'll be talking about is the 1590s crisis, but more specifically the plague and death which are experienced in 1597. And now the 1590s have been seen as a time of crisis for decades, from the work of Peter Clark on the so-called crisis of the 1590s to crisis historian Geoffrey Parker extending his narrative of climate induced catastrophe from the 17th century back in time. And the 1590s are known to have had heightened mortality across England. And the most well known case study of this is that of Northwest England by Andrew Appleby. And there was also heightened mortality in Northeast England, as my analysis of around 50 parish registers from the region shows. The mortality crisis was a result of a combination of food shortages and plague. And a quote from the Border Papers shows the fear of authorities regarding the possible implications of this death. They said, this country is like to be undone for there comes none in, that's no corn, at Newcastle, but only forth of Scotland, which comes weekly to the great relief of the people. In 1596, there were nine parishes for which I found a potential mortality crisis. These were places such as rural uh, locations like Elton, down to areas in Durham City, such as Durham North Bailey, uh, coastal settlements such as Whitburn, Sedgefield is also there, and then there's also the coastal settlement of Bolden. While all of these parishes experienced a double of being of mortality, mortality was above the average in 84.6% of the parishes I surveyed. And the number of parishes seemingly unaffected, although the reality is not so simple, is also similar in 1597, with mortality above average in all but seven of the 38 parishes I was able to analyse this complete string of data for. The number of parishes experiencing a potential mortality crisis is much higher in 1597 than 1596. The parish with the highest mortality ratio for the earlier year, 1596, is Bolden, and the Durham Quarter Sessions Roll shows the impacts of this upon um, disorderly behaviour. There was attempts to punish disorderly behaviour when an individual broke the clothes of another and two other men were pros prosecuted from vagrancy from the single settlement alone. One of the most noticeable patterns from this visual representation of mortality in 1597, while looking at the, uh, any number above two means that burials doubled and any number below two means that, the pro that by this measurement there wasn't a mortality crisis, is that mortality crisis was clustered around Durham City and the surrounding parishes. Some of the highest mortality ratio values for the late 16th century are found in Durham City parishes in 1597. In St Giles, Durham, burials reached four times the nine year average. In St Mary North Bailey, five times the nine year average, and in Durham St Margaret, 10.9 times the nine year average. So the impact of the plague upon Durham City is well documented. For example, administrative records were disrupted in St Oswald, and the clerk later was able only to record the number of burials taking place in the streets of Albert during the visitation. There was no um, attempt to make a list of who had actually died. It was, it was too much. There was too many dead people as a result of the plague. Um, speculatively, I would suggest that the plague deaths in um, St Oswald's Parish would have been clustered around the poorer areas of Elva in areas inhabited by recent migrants, uh, but that's not something it's possible to prove from these documents alone. My case study for 1597 I'd like to talk briefly to you about is Durham St Giles, and this consists of what's known as the Gilesgate area of the city uh, in Durham itself, as well as outlying areas of Belmont, Broomside, Carville, Keepier Grange, Old Grange, New Durham and Gilesgate Moor. In 1563, Durham St Giles consisted of 107 households uh, and using a standard multiplier, this gives an estimated population of 546. This means it had more residents than some areas of the city, such as North and South Bailey combined. It's a large sized pa uh, parish and the impact a medium-sized parish, sorry, 
and the impact of 1597 crisis on the burials can be seen quite dramatically in the spike on the graph there. The 1597 is completely out of the ordinary. And the clerk quite handily gives information about when the play began and the register marks it out. He says the play began the second time since the records began so that's since the mid uh, 1580s and it's possible to reconstruct what actually happened in the uh, parish over the course of a matter of months. So the play began the second time and the first death is that of a female servant in the house of John Howell on August 4th. This is followed 10 days later by the next plague death, one of John's children perhaps infected by the maid directly. On 18th of August John's wife Margaret dies and he succumbs the following day. The first death in the plague that may have been outside the Howell household is that of John Howell's father on August 16th. Scott and Duncan found extremely limited evidence of household transmission amongst supposed plague burials in Durham St Mary, another Durham parish, but the situation in Durham St Giles is far more complicated. Some plague deaths are marked as PLA, meaning plague, but not all of them, uh, but there is a level of transmission to family members far closer to expected levels than what Scott and Duncan found. So who's dying in Durham St Giles during this plague outbreak? Now, I, in, in my analysis, I considered that all burials were for parent given, I put them as being children, though in reality these individuals could have been unmarried young adults. Five of the individuals buried are listed as aged, so they're elderly, and a handful more are widows and un of unmentioned age. 35 burials are children and 70 are adults who it was not possible to determine an age for from the limited sources available. Some of the children do not actually have names or gender given, but there is gender information available for 99 burials, which is 90% of the total of 1597 crisis. Um, the selectivity of mortality during crisis events such as famine and outbreaks of plague is an important area of crisis scholarship. Sharon DeWitt found little impact of sex upon mortality risk during the Black Death in London, while Daniel R. Curtis and John Rosen find, found sex selectivity and more women dying in plague years than usual. Looking to St Giles in 1597, burials are almost evenly split. There is a sex ratio of 1.02 to 1, for every 50 female burials there are 49 male and only around 40 of the burials during the visitation are explicitly marked as plague burials but this is likely to be a vast understatement given the um the graph shown on the screen which shows that the burials are clustered around the traditional plague months august september and october thinking about how much loss was experienced by individual families within the community the median number of losses among surname groups experiencing at least one death was 1.5 it sadly wasn't possible to um, complete a family reconstitution for this period, the way I've done for St Oswald's in Durham in the later um, 17th century, because the register for St Giles only begins in the 1580s. But an important thing to note about the 1597 crisis is that family annihilation was not a common feature. It's difficult to determine how many households these losses were split between, but those that did occur obviously represented a significant loss for individual families community wasn't completely destroyed however. So thinking about the experience of plague in Durham St Giles in more detail, uh, was, it, was there a silver lining or is there a apparent silver lining of poison chalice? I'll go into a bit more detail to explain. So there was a steep drop in the population caused by the plague, 100 burials as a percentage of the population is a really dramatic number. However, there are signs of recovery very quickly. When we look at the baptism records for the parish, we see that between 1587 and 1596, there was an average of 10.9 baptisms annually. Between 1600 and 1609, this figure is 12.6, a slight increase. A similar but slightly less drastic situation is to be found in burials. 19 was the average pre-plague and over the following years of 1609, 18.9. So what does this suggest about the situation in Durham St Giles post-plague? This, these initial signs of recovery hide a potentially important aspect of community life. For these recoveries to be possible in spite of the losses, it could be the case that these are as a result of in-migration. With the loss of members of existing families and their replacement by new groups, could this have an impact on community cohesion? This is something I'm looking to explore more generally for the 17th and 16th century. Thinking about what the impact of these losses are, is it the case that these are outsiders to the community as I found for St Durham St Oswald's perhaps having a limited uh, impact upon the community as a whole, or is this something that has negative impacts for the wider community outside of the family? What are some of the key aspects of the top level data for late 16th century mortality crisis? 
The first thing to note is that Durham City appears to be especially unlucky within its wider County Durham context and within the North East as a whole. One of the major factors in this, of course, is the geographic specificity of plague outbreaks. One town can be completely decimated by plague, while other settlements are completely saved. The plague hit Durham City in 1597 exceptionally hard, and the chapelry of St Margaret's experienced burials at a catastrophic rate. The parish was completely overwhelmed by the losses it faced and had to bury people in nearby St Oswald's, which caused problems for years to come. Meanwhile, in Greatham, a few miles down the road, a coastal settlement, the late 16th century wasn't the time of crisis at all, really, in this time anyway. Greatham had benefited from a medieval charitable foundation at the site, which provided arms for a small number of distressed men from the county. And I would also argue that it created a more charitable uh, atmosphere, although I haven't been able to prove that quite yet due to limited evidence. But in Greatham, the burials are limited. The impact generally in um, demographic terms of these crises is very small. And burials don't reach double the normal figure in either 1587 or 1597. And another case study I'd like to share is plague in Newcastle. Um, this is significant because Newcastle is somewhere that experiences the plague in very dramatic terms. Uh, the later example of 1636 is discussed in a lot of detail by Keith Wrightson in a brilliant book. Um, and this earlier example has also been discussed before by Andy Byrne, uh, who was a PhD student at Durham, who found evidence of the costs associated with protective measures during the outbreak. And a butcher was hired to kill dogs in 1596, and in 1597 men were paid to search out strangers and to see in the 1590s whether a man dead on a ship was a plague victim. The outbreak also disrupted the assizes in Durham and Northumberland. Now looking at the experience uh, demographically on this graph, the striking aspect of this plague outbreak in Newcastle is that mortality continues throughout the winter of 1597. It doesn't slow down as you would expect for plague deaths, but burials continue to be marked as pest burials into March 1597-8. The first plague burial in this outbreak was uh, the death of Merchant Richard Lynn's son, and then it continues on from there. From March 1597 to March 1597-8, there are 169 burials in Newcastle St John, and 98 of these are directly attributable to the plague, although the actual toll may have been slightly higher than that. Approximately 80% of the deceased were the only plague victim in the parish amongst individuals by their surname. There were a few people who uh, experienced it far worse, for example, the Fletchers, Within two groups of the Fletcher family, there was uh, four losses. Henry Fletcher lost both his wife and daughter, and John Fletcher lost two children. And this combination of dearth conditions in 1597, alongside multiple serious waves of contagious disease, puts considerable strain on community relations, and there was genuine concern by the authorities in the 1590s regarding the security of Newcastle, given um, what was going on here with um, the dearth. So the plague initially spread slowly in Newcastle, as indicated by the number of days between pest burials. There were a small number of plague deaths in April, followed by eight in May, three in June and two in July. And this initial outbreak of the plague may be best treated separately from the main outbreak during the summer. And this start, this starts in Newcastle St John's with the death of Michael and Wardo on 31st of July, and mortality starting among servants, but then spreading with household transmission going on from there. The number of days between plague deaths increases towards the end of the year, with signs of the crisis abating by mid-December. There is almost a month between the burial of Nicholas Burnwell's son on the 30th of December and that of the next plague victim, an unidentified Thompson child. In March 1597-8, a Scottish man dies at the home of Widow Collingwood. She may have been employed as a plague nurse. At the home of Dame Pearson earlier in the outbreak, a child had died. So this is what it looks like from the parish registers. You just get an insight into the names of the deceased and then you need to piece things together from there. Moving to the next slide. And so that one of the um, interesting aspects of using parish registers to discuss crisis is you get a small insight into what people's lives may have been like, but these need to be uh, combined with narrative sources to bring the plague and the dearth to life. Um, so briefly, I'm going to give, um, just as a close, I want to give a case study story of how other sources, non-competitive wills, can uh, bring the plague to life in a way that demographic data may possibly not be able to do. So non-competitive wills are wills which are produced by word of mouth. So the impact of the plague can be seen clearly in this example. In 1597, a man called Thomas died in Durham of natural causes, not the plague. He recorded his last wishes and was able to provide for his wife, nine children, and two servants, and then he grasped the hand of his kinsman Gregory and begged him to look after the care of his spouse and children, 
because it wasn't the plague, he was able to physically touch his loved ones and pray together and do all of the things that he would do on the deathbed. But if he'd had the plague, he would have been shut up in his house with no visitors. Watchmen would have been nearby, ensuring no one visited. Or he could have been dying in a field far from his family, like a man elsewhere in Durham, who recorded three separate nuncipative will, wills uh, while dying uh, in a plague lodge in an attempt to make sure his wishes were known. One, that's one of the things that is difficult when using demographic data is that you don't get all of the aspects uh, of the experience that can be given from other sources. So, for example, Sybil from Bolden, the community that had been expected quite badly by mortality crises, as I discussed briefly before, she had the plague in 1597 and she knew as a clerk wrote that she was soon to die. She made attempts to provide for potentially vulnerable female relatives. The will is a scribbled mess. There are comments on how long it took her to die, which have been crossed out mid-sentence, and the clerk includes a grim epigraph at the end of the text. It's a quote from a Latin poet about the fleeting nature of life. And when you combine sources like this with demographic sources, you get a much better insight into what it might have actually been like to live through the plague in an early modern community. So to conclude, the experience of mortality crises in northeast England during the late 16th century differs on a parish by parish level. Even during key national crisis years, the mortality impact on different locations may be muted. And as overcrowding contributes to the plague and death is experienced especially harshly by marginal individuals, the wealth of a settlement is a factor in the mortality cost experienced. However, other things such as the response of authorities, local magnates come into play, as well as the existing population structures and the choices of individuals. Parish registers uh, give a fascinating insight into the world of early modern communities and they are best used alongside other sources as I've begun to do in my PhD studies so far. So thank you so much for listening and I'm sorry you can't see my face because of the tech issues but there's my face on the screen you can see the photo I guess um, and I'd love to carry on the conversation if anyone would like to get in touch my email and Twitter account are on the screen and if you want to hear me talk more about crisis and um, the article that was produced by the autoethnography group I'm part of uh, can be found if you just google my name it'll come up uh, the swearing in the title so I haven't included the title on the slide uh, for YouTube reasons uh, or you can check out Crisis Lives on Spotify which is a podcast I've just started so thank you for listening I'll come back to um, video of you thank you so much Emma you're so right how those descriptive sources really add the human beings back into the narrative don't they so much so and some of it sounds horribly familiar i'm sure some mm. of us are thinking <laughs> at the minute um we have got time to take questions for both of our speakers so i'm going to invite louise to come and stand back up here again i'm afraid <laughs> you stand in front of the camera oh thank you <laughs> so um and you can all see emma we can see you on the board emma so we can see you as well um <laughs> can i have questions for us if we've got any Speakers. Oli. Louise, that was very good, very interesting. Thank you. Um, what about the women? We have the fishermen. Um, what do the women do in this couple? And what sort of jobs and roles did they take? Uh, well, uh, the they would obviously have had connections with, with the, the, the fishing industry, um, so they would be shore based jobs um, that they would be. Um, engaged in. Plus, also, although I've, I've talked about it being um, a maritime community, they did operate um, farming as well. So, you know, the, the, the women would have been at home while the men were out on their voyages, producing the food and doing those those jobs um, within the community as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Guys, one to one. Yes. Yeah. 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 No, no, just, just, just for balance, go, go, go to Emma. Emma, to, to what extent do you get a sense of of weather patterns in advance of, of the plague uh, and how that might af affect host and vector populations. Uh, and also to what extent do, do you get any sense of diminished grain yields in the year or two before a plague epidemic? In other words, poorer harvests in, in a year or two beforehand are um, in, increasing the sort of vulnerability of, of human populations of hosts in advance of plague. Um, there's definitely for the 1597. I've definitely there's definitely diminished um, 
half like the diminished levels of grain before that, but I haven't looked at grain prices or grain yields in detail yet. Um, but in terms of the other question about hosts and vectors, that's a really interesting thing to take into account. Um, definitely something for me to think about more. Uh, I know that the situation in Newcastle feels quite different um, to elsewhere in the region. It does feel like the um, the plague is being spread multiple times rather than it coming from outside. Something's happening within. So on the graph of the days between the plague burials, it definitely feels like it's being seeded multiple times from within the city. Whereas the other examples I've seen so far, it feels like it's coming in to the community from outside. And I think that matches up with, I don't know if it was Appleby or somebody else talked about um, plague is endemic in Newcastle in this period. So I think that might possibly come into it. Um, but I think it would definitely be interesting for me to graph out the days between plague um, burials and see what the case is in different places. So thank you. Um, so the question I was going to ask you, Marie, is, is to, to, to what extent can you use your um, will evidence to sort of plot uh, references to fishing and see whether that correlates to the decline of the settlement over time, in other words, the impact of, of, of coast erosion. Because what's, what's interesting is the, the, the sort of late 13th, early 14th century document and Eastern Balance doesn't seem to be eroding very much at all from that information. And, 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 and in your period and now, it's flying back at a rate of knots. So it obviously wasn't a hot spot once upon a time, and it, and it then does become a hot spot. Um, and of course, you, you can't discover how much it's losing over time. To what extent does your will evidence give you some insight into, into how coastal change might be impacting upon mariners, fishing, and, and those activities? Yeah, I mean, that, that is the thing with the erosion. You've got the erosion and the accretion going up and down the coast. And, and whilst it might be more prevalent in one area at one date, um, as you say, in, in Eastern during the 1400s, it, it's supposedly you know not not um, coming in quickly. Um, the the wills, um, I've been able to um, plot sort of the, the, the changes in the the operation of fishing so the the bequeathing of nets dies out completely sort of the 1540s 1550s and you get a change in um the uh, agricultural um you know you start getting livestock being left and, and agricultural equipment being left and bequeathed now whether this is just um, a change in the economics of fishing in general, because obviously after the Reformation, you know, you've got the fishing um, dying off. So it's trying to understand from other sources about whether that is the erosion and the accretion that's causing that change. I've, I think that the, it, that the haven at Easton definitely silted up, which obviously would have had um, a, an effect on on the population, but they it seems from what I've sort of found so far that they actually moved slightly southwards towards Southwold and started using Southwold Harbour um, and various creeks for fishing. So at that point they were probably still operating fishing, but they weren't being of Eastern. They were Eastern men using Southwold. So that's something that is sort of gradually coming out with further research. Yeah. Can I just ask you is, um, about the fishing industry at the time, if you like? It wasn't industry. I mean, was it just subsistence? Was it just subsistence fishing, or were they actually processing fish, or some uh, and somehow you know selling the fish to other other areas? And it, well, do you, I mean, does any of that come out in your? Not not from my my sort of research not necessarily in, in the wills, but obviously you'd got the merchants with the Icelandic um, yeah. fish, fishing trade that, that was then sold on um, for, for monetary gain. It wasn't just the, the catches that the community would would use. Um, uh, yeah, because um, you were asked about um, about the involvement of women. And I just, I was just thinking of all the the, 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 the herring lasses in the armour, you know, yeah. well, two or three centuries on, and I just wondered if the women were involved at all in 
processing any of the uh, of, of the, the product, the produce of the seed. So the selling of. In, in some of the wills you get mention of, of um, herring sprats or, or sprats which would like the wooden um, uh, skewers that they would then so they yeah so that they would have dried the fish and, and yeah. there's this area called bloaters hill which has come up from the manorial survey which sounds like a high area um which i think possibly may have been used for for drying the fish yeah. um to obviously keep it over the over the um, uh, either for months. use in the community or yeah. in the family or yeah. perhaps some of it was so long uh, yeah I, I, I don't I haven't gone into the, the economics of the, the fishing industry to that. Certainly they'd have been eating it themselves. Oh yeah, absolutely. But there was money to be made. Um yeah, I mean uh, you know, fish was being supplied into into London. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, from those. Um, I've got a question for Emma. Um you touched on it, but I'm I'm quite interested about the responses to uh, plague and death. Uh, uh, you mentioned Durham, but like Officially in the north, uh, in the northeast, um, like, did you see any differences? Did it make a difference as to any? Because I think it's 1597 where they begin to uh, introduce the church wardens into poor relief and things like that. Have you seen any kind of responses to that, or any any notice in your research as to whether they difference at all? Um, for 1597, the only thing I've looked at so far is the um, demographic data. Um, but the one thing I have noticed. Um, just looking at that and the things I know from St Oswald's Parish, which is what I did an earlier case study on, was that there's a big um, issue between St Oswald's Parish, which is the one um, like stretches out miles out of Durham, and St Margaret's, which is a chapelry. And when St Margaret's experiences the really high burials um, to do with plague in 1597, there's a lot of disruption between the two because St Margaret's wants to use St Oswald's land to bury their dead, but St Oswald's believes that that isn't appropriate, um, even though it's a chapelry of that parish and there's a lot of disruption over the coming like, decades about who should be buried there and what the relationship between the two is. There's a lot of discussion in St Oswald's church warden accounts in later years about trying to get money for things like ladders and church building repairs from St Margaret's and they don't want to give them. So there's a lot of tension uh, on a community level between what's appropriate to do and what isn't. Um, and then thinking about later plague responses, there's some interesting orders in Durham in the 1640s. I think it was 1643 that are specific to Durham City where they produce their own plague orders with a list of things to do that are specific to that town. Um, I do think that the responses are something that is quite interesting because it's a question of whether it's altruistic trying to prevent, you know, people from dying of starvation or if it's whether trying to prevent disorder. And that's definitely something I want to think about going forward when people are trying to prevent things. Is it because they want to protect the population or is it like some of the things that are found in the border papers suggest it's because they want to stop rioting? Thanks, really um, I, uh, I have actually a question for both of you. I thought they were great papers that really worked together. But I, I wanted to I ask you first something in that because it kind of picks up what, what Ashley just said. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about in your paper is these rural parishes, particularly in 1587, which, if I understood you right, was more about dearth than plague. Is that right? And you mentioned the, the different ways in which some parish, parishes really were affected by this in terms of death and other ones weren't. And this is a point of ignorance, but if, I mean, do all these parishes have ministers? And if, if, if they don't, would that affect where the burials are registered? Like, if you didn't have a local minister, would you just get your person buried in the next parish because they had a minister who could perform the rites? Or is that not a dynamic that? Um, so all of the parishes have um, their own um their own churches and their own clerks. But one of the interesting dynamics was for one of the um, more rural parishes that I looked at. I think it was Ronald Kirk in North Yorkshire for the 1580s. And because of so many different villages, sometimes you get the sense that people aren't well known at all to the um, to the community where, the, um, where they're being buried. So being buried somewhere slightly different to where they live and there's all the different villages coming together. Um, so the actual parish itself will have its own minister and its own um, clerk, but when they're spread out so um, over such a geographically spread area, sometimes it can be differences in terms of how well known people are to different areas of the community. So for example in Durham, um, 
people who live in the Elba area of the city. So when I did it, um, I looked at all of the wills for 1650 to 1700, and there's not a lot of connection between people who live in Albert in the city to the people who live in the rural area. The people in the rural area of the parish are much more connected to villages like Toto, so they're more interested in that rural community. And then the people in the um, suburban area of the parish are much more involved in the Nike Durham city community. So there is sometimes a situation where you've got people who are being mentioned in the parish registers who are buried in the parish, but there isn't really a sense of community belonging, and it's often because they're connected to a parish that's just on the other side of the border in the boundary. Oh, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Yeah, I can. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Don't feel you have to. <laughs> Actually, like during your paper, Louise, I was just thinking the whole time, like whether you use parish registers. So it was lovely to hear Emma's paper about it, all based on that. But I mean, because you, there, there's that as well, because you go to 1700, was your account? Like, yeah. there, there are no parish registers. Um, that's yeah, 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 there are no. It, well, it, well, it, it's quite interesting because um, there's, there's differing opinions as to when the church actually disappeared. Um, it's thought to have gone um, or gone down to erosion in the 1630s. I think from my research that it actually went a lot earlier. Mm -hmm. Certainly in wills, they're asking to be buried in the churchyard of Easton up to sort of the 1580s. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, at that point, they then stop and they, you actually get them asking to be buried in the neighbouring um, Raiden or in Southwold churchyard. So the, the churchyard was unstable at that point or you know, about to go over. Um, yeah, there are no there are no surviving parish registers, and I am using the surrounding parishes where there are early survivals. Cove Hives parish registers um, start in the the um, 1500s. Um, Southwold's frustratingly don't start till 1602, um, and mapping where Eastern Bavins people are occurring in those registers to try and plot to see if that information will tell me at some point, you know, when the, ch the church has stopped being, being used by the community and the church is lost. Mm -hmm. What about like, so there's like all these like tax records from the 17th century, like have you got to those yet? Like, yeah, yeah, I'm there? looking, there's, there's an ecclesiastical return in yeah. 1603, there's um, a, a return called the Able Men of Suffolk, which is about the volunteers. Um, in the 1530s, you've got the half tax 1674. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, the, the population just absolutely plummets. But in 20 minutes, I just thought I'd focus on the, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the early yeah, 1500s yeah. rather than try and spread too much in. Yeah. I have a question, Louise, if that's okay. Yeah. I'm to like bombard you. I was just wondering, do you get a sense from the wills that people are choosing to leave or whether people are keeping their connections within the parish? So are people's connections further afield or when the um, village starts to sink into the sea, do they start moving on? Um, that, that, that's an interesting, interesting point. The, the wills themselves actually more or less finish in the early 1600s. They, they go um, you know, from, from a lot of wills in the latter 1500s, then down to the early 1600s, you've got one or two wills, which is when the period of, of the, you know, the real decimation starts or, or the population moving out. So I think I'm going to try and plot where those, it's trying to plot where the people move to. Yeah. So I've got to find where they are to know that they are the people who have moved from Eastern. And then it will probably be quite interesting to see their wills where they're in a different place you know where they've moved to and that is part of the research to understand where they moved to did did they move into southwold which was you know becoming a, a larger borough or did they move um you know within a fairly short radius out into other neighboring villages yeah great thanks any more questions for any of our speakers no okay, okay. well thank you ever so much both of you um i will put our last slide up uh, just to advertise next week. Um, so thank you all for coming this week and hopefully you might be able to join us again next week as well. Um, we're doing another sort of hybrid one speaker in the room, one speaker online seminar next week. It seems to have worked this week, so that's brilliant. Um, we've got Benjamin Anderson joining us from the University of Edinburgh, who's speaking about Vermont, Ethan Allen and the American Revolution. And then we've got Sandra Brown, who's at UEA, uh, is speaking about Mary Astle's books. So thank you ever so much for coming this week again and I hope to see some of you next week. <laughs>